Hello and welcome to my channel. I am Jamaica 411. Whether you're here for the first time, I repeat visitor or subscriber, welcome. I want to thank you for stopping by and spending some time with me today. If you like the content, please give the video a thumbs up and share with all your friends who you think may be interested in the channel. And don't forget to subscribe as well. It is also important to hit the notification bell so that whenever I upload a video, you'll be notified and can tune in and be the first to um, comment on anything that you find interesting that I may have to say. So now, let us get right into our analysis of today. So today we look at the mystery of the death of Melissa Silveira. Now just to give you a brief background, who is Melissa Silveira? Well, Ms. Melissa Silveira was a mother, wife, and a very bright young woman. She was a chemical engineer employed to Petrojam. And a chemical engineer, she was one of the few that um, is in the island of Jamaica. Her mother was the very esteemed and stalwart, a developer. As a matter of fact, the complex in which Melissa was killed was um, a subdivision that was developed by her mother. And we do believe that the house that she was living was her own house, Melissa's house. Now, Melissa's Melissa is also the wife of former Member of Parliament, Julian Silveira. Her maiden name, of course, was Walter. She was Melissa Walter. Now, ever since these last few years, the family of the Silveiras were hit with one or two little tragedies. First one occurred in 2017 when their young son, a two-year-old boy, and the, one of the twins drowned in a pool at their home. Then last year, 2023, Melissa's mom, Leslie Davis, died of cancer. She was buried. Six months later, Melissa was to follow her in what appears to have been a, an untimely manner. She was killed by the hands of man. So we're looking now at Melissa's death and uh, to try and fit together the bits and pieces of information that we have so far concerning how she came to lose her life. Now it is said that nature abhors a vacuum. And in the absence of timely information from the police, who the Constitution of Jamaica charged with the responsibility for investigating crime, we are left to do our own analysis of what may have happened, just to befit those pieces that we, of information that we have been getting together. Now, what do we know? of the death of Melissa Silveira. In any analysis, we must first begin with the facts. So what are the facts surrounding Melissa Silveira's death? The first thing we know is that she was reported to have died on Friday, November 10, 2023, at her home on Old Stony Hill Road. The second thing we know about her death is that it was reported that she died peacefully in her sleep. That report, interestingly enough, did not come from the police. It came from the leader of the opposition, Mark Golding, who is the benefactor, employer of Melissa's husband, Joylan Silvera. It appears as though it, it, Joyland is his chief of security. 
He was the one who published that information. And we know because when we checked to see where the newspaper got, um, the media got that information from, they, almost all of them, said that they, it was reported on Mark Golding's page, his Instagram page and his Facebook page. So the various media houses took that information from Mark Golding's page, pages, and published. Four weeks later, we were all shocked to have learned from Nationwide News, while they were live, one of their journalists received a telephone call informing him it was a tip from, I guess, a concerned citizen, whistleblower, I'm not sure what they call it. But it was a tip that he received that an autopsy was done and that the autopsy report stated that Melissa was shot at least three times. Later we learned that she was shot twice in her abdomen and once in her leg. Now, as you can imagine, this caused a great deal of consternation among the people. Questions were being asked. How did Melissa Silvera's death, being shot at least three times, was unnoticed by the police? Was the police even called? So in the course of responding to all these questions, information came out by and by. And it was said that um, when Melissa was found, a report was made to the police and a police sergeant from North St. Andrew Police Station arrived on the scene. He was alone. Now it is important to note that when this policeman arrived at the scene, and uh, made his various examination. I suppose he may have asked questions concerning her death. Not a word was published by the police about Melissa's death. All the information came from the political directorate until four weeks later when the autopsy revealed that she died from gunshot wounds. So now, we have a lot more questions to ask. So in the absence of information coming from the police in a timely manner, in the absence of such information, our vloggers, persons who know of Melissa, persons who have contacts in the police, persons who have contact in the political director, and everybody went out doing their own checks to try and bring us information. And so some of the information that supplemented the facts that we already know came from other sources, other sources than official them. There is a blogger by the name who calls himself The Advisor, and he reported that the two gunshots that Melissa received to the abdomen were two gunshots in her vagina, and the other one in her leg. He said she was shot at least four times, but the fourth bullet they have not recovered. He also said that Melissa's body was not in her matrimonial bedroom. Her body was in the guest's bedroom in her home. The room was neat and orderly, nothing suggesting violence occurring there. So you can imagine when the police sergeant arrived, Sergeant Dabney, he would have been looking around for, you know, visually to see what could have caused this death. He would have been speaking to persons at the home and they would have been telling him something. He would have glanced around, seen nothing suspicious. And according to the gleaner though, he was attempting to lift the sheet because a sheet was covering her 
and uh, somebody prevented him from doing so. That was one of the stories that came out, that was reported in the Gleaner. Now, according to the advisor, he said that Melissa was cleaned up, dressed in what he called a tight black panty girdle, you know, those girdles that, um, you know, you, you bring up like a brassiere, something like that he said she was dressed in. She was in clean pajamas, and her hair, according to him, was combed, very neatly combed. And I do recall that he said there was a little blood coming from her nose. Another vlogger, he is, he calls himself Jamaican Young Police. He was the one who first provided us with the name and rank of the policeman who arrived on the scene. Apparently it's somebody that he knows. He said his name um, is Sergeant Dabney. Sergeant Dabney, of course, went there alone. Now he said Dabney, which is very interesting. He said Dobney recorded in the station diary that Melissa had died from sudden death. In other words, there were three classifications of death. Whenever a person dies outside of a medical facility, there are three classifications. One is natural causes, the second is sudden death, and the third is death by violence or crime. Well, he clearly wasn't satisfied that it was natural causes, maybe because, or possibly because, a doctor was not there, or maybe he was suspicious. Based upon what he was told, though, he came to the conclusion that this is sudden death. What that meant was that an autopsy had to be done in order to ascertain what Melissa's cause of death was. Those are the rules. <coughs> now, according to the Gleaner, they had an investigative reporter who said in one of their articles that a close family member, a close friend of the family, said that Melissa's son was the one who found her. According to what the Gleaner said, she was sitting up in bed, bleeding from her waist. That's what the Gleaner reported. Now, we don't know what exactly what this meant. We don't know if this meant that he, the son, found her soon after she was shot or sometime during the night, just before the police was called. So we don't know that. The Glean also reported that neighbors they spoke to said they had not heard any gunshots fired that night. Now, if persons know Old Stony Hill, I, I can tell you something about it. It is a very, ex it's, it's a rural, it's like a suburb, but it's very rural. A lot of bushes, it's in the hills, it's extremely quiet, not much traffic. And at, if the report was made late in the night, then in, at the dead of night, you can imagine how quiet it, it, would, it would be. Of course, you know, neighbors could have been watching their TVs or, you know, something. But they reported that they heard no gunshot that fired that night. And it would appear as though if the persons in the home did not hear gunshots either. Now, when we look now at other sources, we have um, statements on her Facebook page made by a close associate of Joyland Silveira and Melissa Silveira, a PNP a blogger, a Rise United blogger, I beg your pardon. Her name is Kamala Forbes. And she reported that Melissa was bleeding from her nose and that they all thought she had died from an aneurysm. Now she denies that she was there, but that kind of talk and the certainty with which she said what she said without saying she heard from a somebody else clearly would suggest that she was there at some time. And uh, another source of information that we have is 
Silvera's attorney. King's counsel, Peter Champagny, who said his client was not there. Kamala Forbes also said he was not there initially. Now, with respect to what Champagne said, we don't know what time Champagne was referring to. Was his client not there when his wife was found dead? Was that what he meant? Or was he not there at the time the, op the pathologist estimated that Melissa had died? Two different things. So which is it? We don't know. But I doubt, though, that Champagne would have said Silvera was not at home unless he could prove it. So that now is very interesting. So these are the things we know concerning the shooting death of Melissa Silvera. Now we come to the questions. How do we fit these bits and pieces of information together as we ask ourselves, how was Melissa Silvera killed? What time was she killed? Who killed her and why? So in our analysis now, we are going to attempt to fit all these bits of pieces of puzzle. Let's call them puzzles to see if we can come, with up, come up with something that makes sense. Now, the first puzzle, the first question we need to ask ourselves. Why did it take so long for the police to find out Melissa was murdered? Now, the explanation that was given was that when Sergeant Dobney apparently arrived at the scene, he did not examine Melissa's body for signs of violence. According to the Gleaner, the police source that they spoke to said that Sergeant um, Dobney was prevented from doing so by some unnamed person at the scene. There was a sheet covering Melissa, as I said before, he wanted to lift the sheet just to see and make sure he's satisfied that she died um, of natural causes, as clearly it was being explained to him by somebody at the home. But he was prevented from doing so. The individual, which was not named, claimed that Melissa was naked. He was alone, therefore he couldn't assert his authority or choose not to, perhaps um, according to one of the, the, vlogger, the vloggers. Um, he, admitted, he, he knows Joel and Sylvia and they are some kind of um, associates or friends or something. So maybe he trusted him. It's natural human instinct. Unfortunately, um, John and Sylvia was not to be trusted, so it's not somebody he should have trusted. Got himself into trouble, I'm sure. But his colleagues found that he did nothing wrong. Well, he did something wrong in going by himself, but it was not out of any corrupt um, thought, you know, why he did it. So for the answer to this puzzle, this puzzling question. We will need to know more about guns and um, their impact on the human body. So, three gunshots were fired. No one heard those shots. The question is, how come? So let us now look at what I found out when I did a little research on firearms, firing of firearms, how they impact the body, and uh, how the, you know, the, the firearm actually works. The, that noise that you hear, what is causing it, and um, how it might be muffled, naturally. So I found this article in this um, group called Quora, and um, what they said is that the sound that you, the person said, the one that did the, the, the report, he said that the sound that you hear when a gun is fired comes from two main sources. 
The first one is the mechanisms of the gun itself. The guns, the gun itself, as it is going through the motion, you know, you pull back the, the trigger and so on. You hear all these click, click, click and clacking sound. Good. So that's the first sound. The second sound you hear is from the bullet with a sudden blast of a cloud of gas. So the, the, the bullet is surrounded, is in a case. It's surrounded by chemicals, some chemical mixture. And when the, the, um, the hammer hits the bullet pin, the bullet inside, pressure builds up on the inside, explodes, and uh, the, 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 the projectile now, which is the bullet, is pushed forward at very, very high speed. It is the movement of the air as a bullet and the cloud of gas which is going through the muzzle, it's when it exits, that is when now you hear the low banging sound. It sounds a little like, for those persons who may have heard, watch TV, seen, seen it in real life, a sonic boom. So, so that is what they, are, they said happens when the gun is fired. That is what causes the sound that you hear. The sound is therefore coming mainly from the muzzle of the gun. In other words, that gunshot sound you hear is created inside the muzzle. Then the, as the bullet travels outside of the gun, that's when you hear that big bang. So it, the bullet, the, 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 the sound is created inside the muzzle and then the sound travels outside of the muzzle, and that is when you hear this big bang sound. All right? You get it now? Great. Because it's very important for what I'm going to tell you next. So now, the explanation for why it is that nobody heard this gunshot, or these gunshots, three of them. And I suspect they may have heard one, but not realize that it was a gunshot. You know how these things are. You hear one sound, you wonder what that is. It sounds like gunshot, but you don't hear it again, so you say, maybe you're not hearing right. So, with Melissa being shot twice in her vagina, what effect would that now have on the sound of the gunshots being heard, even within her own home? If her killer got the muzzle of the gun inside her vagina, it would definitely muzzle the sound of the bullets as that loud sonic boom of a sound which now is going to ex escape through the muzzle would occur inside of her. That's how it was done. Her organs, now remember she's up, she might be about maybe about 18 inches. The bullet will have to travel. However, it is traveling through organs, tissues, bones, Right? So her organs, maybe even her pelvis, um, would slow down the progress of those bullets. The first one fired would have, made, would have uh, been making its way upward and um, slowed down by the, the, her various organs. The second one, if it follows the same trajectory, may go a little further. But it certainly would make it possible that the bullets would not exit. Now, here's the thing that I read about women who were shot in the vagina. It's not a done thing or a sure thing. You shoot a woman once in her vagina, her chances of survival is very high because I suppose of all those protection that she will be having as the bullet is trying to make it exit to some vital organs. So multiple, shoot, multiple shots is the order of the day. Now, here's the thing. She was shot twice in the vagina and the other one was lodging her leg so this is why i said the third bullet may well have been heard by the household and the neighborhood the question is now when was melissa shot this was supposed to have been the perfect murder Perfect murder. So what went wrong? Now, I, I don't know who in this world 
does not believe that her husband, Joyland Silveira, is her killer, especially after hearing the clumsy attempt at covering up Melissa's murder with claims that she had died in her sleep. As for me, I believe he did it himself. So what were his mistakes, if any? What were his mistakes? You know, I would say the first mistake he made was not calling to the scene a trusty senior policeman above the rank of inspector. A sergeant of police. Silvera, really? A sergeant of police? You have not been paying attention, Joyland. If you were paying attention, you would know that the reasons why people in high society usually get away with murder is because of two things they have. The first thing they have is money. Money. And the second thing that they have going for them is connections. They have money and connections. Money to donate to the police, but if, but <laughs> police benevolent society of the whichever high-ranking police officer they call to the scene. And of course, they need to have on the scene the family doctor. For high society to get away with murder, to ensure that any mistake that they made in their crime, if the crime was premeditated, if the crime was not premeditated. These are the two essential professionals that they need in order to pave the way for a flawless cover-up of the murder. You weren't paying attention. When you were thinking about these things, you were not paying attention. But you were always said not to be very bright, so I'm not surprised. Nobody who sits down and plans a murder can be called a bright person. These are stupid people. These are the first two persons high society call to the scene when they commit murder. So Silvera's first mistake was that he called a low-ranking policeman. A, vlog a vlogger claimed that Silvera knew Sergeant Dabney very well. And if the sergeant actually thought that he was helping his friend Silvera out of a little mess that he found himself in, then by classifying Melissa's death as sudden death, he clearly didn't know what he was doing because that classification meant that an autopsy had to be done. The one thing that her killer would not want or just maybe the sergeant knew exactly what he was doing by classifying her passing as sudden death because Silvera didn't trust him enough to tell him what he had done. And that was the second mistake. To call a policeman to the scene he did not absolutely trust to have his back. His third mistake appears to have been that no doctor, no family doctor, was called to the scene. How could the killer, and um, you know, we think that it may be Joyland, how could he have made such a dreadful mistake? That was a dreadful mistake. Not calling a family doctor to the scene, and he should have been there before the policeman arrived. If he did not trust completely his police friend, the family doctor should have been there first. Or is it possible that they family doctor was actually on the scene. It is possible that a doctor was there. If so, who was it? Now, to understand the doctor's role, why, 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 why do we say a family doctor? Why is it that high society, when they commit crime, they have a family doctor on the scene? Well, you see, it's a family doctor who would um, be the one to advise on how to staunch the blood flow. For example, it is a family doctor who would also assure the police that he was a doctor treating the deceased person. 
of some ailment of some kind, and that in his prof professional opinion, the deceased had died from natural causes of, say, an aneurysm, for argument's sake. In other words, the doctor's job is to provide the cause of death. Now here is where it becomes a little muddled. Very muddled indeed, because we're not quite sure what happened after the sergeant um, left. Did he, for argument's sake, authorize that the body should be removed by the family? Where did he authorize the body to re be removed to? Or did he just look around, took what the family said, tell them it's okay, they can remove the body, and, um, and the body was removed by a funeral home directly to the morgue? Because this is crucial to, any, to the killer. How did, com how did Sergeant Dabney come to make that decision? Did he advise himself? Nothing funny going on here. Or was he influenced by a doctor? Did he speak to a doctor? Either on the phone, maybe one at the scene who told him that there's nothing here. I can certify the cause of death is natural. Was that what happened? That we don't know because we don't know if Melissa was taken to a hospital or whether or not she was taken directly to the morgue. I am suspecting that she was never taken to the hospital. She went directly to the morgue because at the hospital, a doctor would certainly have examined her and find that something not quite right here and reported it to the police. So after four weeks, they could not get the body, of course. The family couldn't get the body because the Sergeant Dabney had recorded her passing a sudden death. So you can't get the body until an autopsy is done. And it was in the autopsy that the doctor, the pathologist, discovered that she was shot at least three times. For this segment of the analysis into the murder of Melissa Silveira, there are things that we need to know which we don't know at this time. For example, what was the time of death? If the police does not know the exact time of death, in other words, somebody said she died at such and such a time, then we, then we must not rely on the estimated time of death according to the autopsy report. Now, of course, in this case, I, the two would be needed because people can't tell lies. And the autopsy, the estimation by the autopsy could be put off by a variety of circumstances. We also need to know who found our body because there is a conflict of information regarding who it was that found her body. The Gleaner reported that a family friend said it was her son who found her sitting up in bed, bleeding from her waist. But according to Bobby Montague, in his post on November 11, which is the few hours after Melissa had died, was found dead, he said that he spoke to Silvera and um, John and Silvera told him that he was by Melissa's side when she died. So, who it was that found the body? Now, we're going to have to wait on the police for that one. Unless somebody can say, you know, what the little boy said. The next question is, when exactly did Silvera leave his home that day? And when did he return home? Because his attorney and uh, Kamla, the mango, said that he was not there. It's also important for the case, that is, that we know what firearm was used. Now, why, for our sake, 
If the gun belonged to Silveira, the gun that was used to kill Melissa belonged to Joanna and Silveira, then it was unlikely that it was premeditated murder. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that killing a woman by shooting her in her vagina was not something he thought of before and researched. But to use his own firearm doesn't sound quite right. It wouldn't be premeditated. However, if the gun that was used was not his own, then this what we're looking at is and was cold-blooded, premeditated murder. Now, when it comes to Silvera saying that he was not at home, that now is another thing that we can examine. If he indeed was not at home when Melissa was found dead, and we're working on the assumption that he's our man, he's a, he's a killer, then it would simply mean that Melissa was killed sometime before he left the house that day. So if for argument's sake, he left at, say, 8 in the morning on the 10th when she had died and did not return to the house until later, after she was found, then what that means is that Melissa was dead before he left the house, if he is the killer. And this is simple common sense. if he kill her. Finally, just in case the police may be stuck and this may be the reason why they are unable to make an arrest, I understand they are expected to make an arrest soon. According to one vlogger, he said that they are waiting on one little item. But just in case they may want more information or at least information that would blow this case wide open for them i would suggest that they take a look at joyland silvera's sister she sat two seats to his left she was the one in black she was bawling more than anybody else at the church service. I noticed it. And it reminded me of something. And she was crying profusely for a sister-in-law. You could see that her eyes were red. And when the church service was over and they were wheeling the casket of Melissa out of the church, she broke down. You know what I think? I believe she knows what happened to Melissa. I believe she knows because her brother told her. And she was weeping because she was worried sick, worried for her brother, his children, her mother, herself, and her family. I think she knows. I think she knows, and I think she knows because Silvera told her. Now, I'm not the one who is going to be telling the police how to do their business. They certainly have not asked us for any help. Did anybody notice that? Have you, have you noticed? Fitz Bailey has asked no one for any help in the matter. No information is put out that would allow persons who may know something to know what is going on, and so the police, they can help the police with the case. They're not interested in anything we have to say. But I can't help but wonder. And I'm of the view that if the police made Silvera's sister understand that they have evidence to charge her with accessory to murder after the fact, I believe she would crack. I believe she would break and, uh, and tell the police what she knows about Melissa's death, assuming she knows anything. I believe so, because you see, if she's a well brought up young lady, this is not the type of thing that she would have pictured for her life, going to jail or before the court.
for anything like this. And uh, this is also why she would be crying. All of this was just not necessary. You know, and all this has been brought, all this attention has been brought down on her family and she's worried. But this is how I would approach it if I were the police. I believe she could be the key to break the case wide open for the police to solve this mystery of the Melissa Silvera's death. Well, I've taken up enough of your time. This is my take on the murder of Melissa Silvera. Let me hear your views. I want to hear what you think. If you have a theory of your own, let me hear it. Let us hear it. Let us discuss it. I want to thank you for spending the little time that you spent with me today. Hopefully, you'll join me next time. Please remember to like and share this video with your friends and hit the subscribe button below. Until next time, walk good.